All right, so we'll get started now. So welcome to our intro to bioinformatics workshop. Um, before we get started, I'll just quickly introduce who we are. So we are Superposition Toronto, a youth-led nonprofit dedicated to bridging the gender gap in STEM by creating educational opportunities and supportive communities. So today we are joined by Teodora, who will get started on our workshop. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to share my slides with you. OK, so everybody, you can see the slides, right? I assume yes. <laughs> Okay, so welcome. Uh, my name is Teodora Tokowska, and I will be introducing the field of bioinformatics. So currently I'm working as a senior bioinformatics analyst, and I'm working at the Princess Margaret Cancer Research Tower. Um, my job uh, involves running data analysis for customers, customers being um, researchers and scientists. I run pipelines and I read a lot of scientific literature, including uh, manuals for um, software tools. I completed my uh, undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto, and I was first introduced to the field of bioinformatics uh, during my second year course. Uh, I was taking a uh, biotechnology course, and I learned that you can combine biology with programming. And so um, I decided to take a few courses in programming, and I, and I loved it. So I decided to just pursue a career in bioinformatics. Um, I completed my my Master of Bioinformatics degree at the University of Guelph. Um, and I learned so many topics in bioinformatics and um, expanding my, my skills in the field. Uh, and I also uh, conducted several research projects as well. So for today's agenda, um, I've broken down this seminar into three sections. So in the first section, I will be discussing some bioinformatics basics. So firstly, I will define what it is and compare to computational biology. Uh, I'll be talking about some uh, applications in bioinformatics, and uh, I do plan on highlighting some um, subfields in bioinformatics. But before I, I I'm not sure um, how everybody knows their biology, but I decided to include some biological terms to introduce you to, uh, as the field of bioinformatics is heavily relied on biology. So um, that will be section one. Then in section two, I will be discussing uh, some commonly used bioinformatics data types. So uh, I've listed them out there, but they're used in the field um, by many bioinformaticians. And I work with these files uh, very regularly. Um, so it's very important to know what these files are. And then in section three, I will be touching upon uh, data analysis. So uh, what it is, what it means in the field, and uh, I'll be providing some tips for you how to conduct a uh, data analysis project. And um, near the end, uh, I will also be highlighting some uh, programming languages that are common in the field, um, some public databases as well. And uh, I've, I've listed some commonly used software tools, not all of them because there are many in the field, uh, but just important ones to start you off. So the first thing I want to define is what is bioinformatics? So Bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field where tools, specifically software tools, are created uh, to collect, to store, analyze, and distribute biological data. And uh, some disciplines in the field involve biology, which is the main one, computer science, and statistics, chemistry, physics, um, many fields. <laughs> so to compare it to computational biology, um, computational biology is the study of biology to make discoveries using data analysis. So where bioinformatics is the creation of tools, computational biology is um, using the tools to make scientific discoveries. However, in the field, it's both of these terms are used interchangeably, and it ultimately it doesn't matter how you use them. I just love to say bioinformatics. Um, and I define myself as a bioinformatician, even though I do a lot of data analysis and I don't create many tools. <laughs> so some applications of bioinformatics involve uh, prediction of protein structure and function, uh, also modeling and prediction and detection of gene regulatory networks, uh, analysis of molecular pathways. You have uh, created uh, there's so many public databases where uh, the st they store biological data such as gene information um, that can be accessed by anyone 
and it could be used for research purposes or even clinicians and physicians, they could access these databases to help them with diagnosis purposes. There's sequence analysis, uh, genome annotation, comparative genomics, and also importantly in health and uh, drug discovery, among others. There are many others as well. Now, just to uh, introduce some biological terms, just in case you are not um, very well versed in biology, uh, just to start off with the central dogma of molecular biology. So this is a theory that was developed by um, one of the founders of DNA. His name is Francis Crick. And he states that genetic information flows from one direction. It is just one direction. So it starts from DNA and DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into protein. Now there's an exception where RNA itself could be reversely transcribed into DNA um, by enzymes, but this is the common dogma, uh, which is very important to know um, when you're, you're working with biological data, specifically with DNA, and you have to convert into RNA, for instance. So it's very important to know uh, the common terms in biology. Um, if you don't know what DNA stands for, it is uh, it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, it is a double helix, so it's double-stranded, where you have two backbones um, of alternating sugar and phosphates, uh, phosphate molecules, and each sugar is attached to uh, a base called a nucleotide. So we have four nucleotides in DNA, thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine, and these make up your genetic code. These are, uh, both of the strands are um, hydrogen bonded together, so that way these, um, they stay together. Uh, so the importance of DNA is because it's the building block of all genetic material. And uh, here I'm just defining what the genome is because you will hear genome a lot in biology, but also in bioinformatics. So the genome is all of the genetic content uh, found in the cell. So in, in a lot of um, eukaryotic uh, organisms, including uh, humans here, we have a cell that contains mitochondrion and uh, nucleus organelles. So in the nucleus, you have nuclear DNA in the form of chromosomes. And us humans, we have 23 um, pairs of chromosomes. And then you have the mitochondrion, which contains a circular piece of DNA called the mitochondrial DNA. So this is your genome. And the importance of studying this genome uh, it is to understand how genes, they ultimately contribute to disease. And so um, we're, trying to under, we're trying to study the genome to better find um, prevention techniques and, and treatments. Oops, sorry. So now we'll be talking about genes. So genes are found on the DNA and they are the basic unit of inheritance. So they're ultimately passed from parents to their offspring or to, the, to their children. So these genes, they contain all the information necessary to ultimately create you, your, both your physical and your biological traits. And most genes, they encode for proteins. Some genes do not. Um, and any mutation that is found on the gene, sometimes it could lead to disease. Um, it adds to the genetic variation. And many people have mutations in their DNA. Um, it's just a problem when it causes disease. And that is why in the field, we try to um, study those mutations, try to understand how they're contributing to disease. And lastly, genes, uh, they're trans as the DNA, it's transcribed from DNA to RNA tra transcripts. And so now RNA itself is a single molecule. Um, it stands for ribonucleic acid. It contains the same um, backbone is the DNA, and you have the four bases uh, similarly to the DNA, except the thymine is uh, converted into a uracil. And so you have um, many different forms of RNA molecules, one of which you've heard from the COVID-19 uh, vaccines that came out, the, arm, uh, the mRNA. mRNA stands for messenger RNA, and this molecule, this transcript, it ultimately will be created into protein. So with the COVID-19 vaccine, that mRNA molecule was uh, created into the spike protein. Um, then you have your transfer RNA molecules and your ribosomal RNA. Uh, these two, they don't turn into protein. They stay as RNA molecules and they're used for translation. 
Now, similarly to the genome, which contains all of your DNA uh, in the cell, the transcriptome is all of the mRNA transcripts that are expressed in the organism. So the messenger RNA, it's not the other types. Uh, the purpose of studying the transcriptome is that it captures the expression of the genome. So when, when genes are being transcribed from your DNA into RNA, that is what we refer to as gene expression. So um, ultimately we try to see what the changes are uh, in the gene expression. So when you have a sick individual versus um, an individual that has a specific disease, you would compare the transcriptomes together to see which genes are being expressed or underexpressed. Then you have your proteins. So the proteins are large complex molecules um, and they're created by multiple polypeptides. Polypeptides are um, long pieces of strands of amino acids. And um, what an amino acid is, it's actually attached to a transfer RNA, which is going to help um, the ribosome translate the mRNA molecule. And so these amino acids, they are combined and attached together to form the entire polypeptide chain. Um, multiple of these uh, polypeptide chains will be combined and form a very complex, large uh, protein molecule. And so uh, the proteins, they help the body to carry out several chemical reactions in you, in your body, to keep you alive. And then you have the proteome. So the proteome is basically all proteins that are expressed in the organism. Similarly to observing and studying the transcriptome, we study the proteome to observe the changes in uh, the ultimately the gene, the organism's expression. I did also want to touch upon sequencing because sequencing is a very, very important topic in bioinformatics itself. Um, sequencing DNA or RNA means that you're trying to understand the order of that specific genetic molecule or the, the whole strand. So for instance, if you're trying to, you take a sample from the liver, you, you cut a little bit of it off, and then you digest it, you extract the DNA from the nucleus or the nuclei from multiple cells, and then you chop up the DNA into pieces and you amplify those pieces of DNA. So the, from one single piece of DNA molecule that's tiny little fragment, you get millions. And those millions of uh, molecules, you will ultimately feed into a machine. Uh, well, it's, it's known as a library. Um, and this library of, of, your, uh, of your genetic material, you will put into a machine called a sequencer. And that ultimately will read each little fragment um, what its genetic code is. So we'll translate it ultimately from the tiny little sample into your computer. So that way you could access that um, information and perform computational analysis. There are many, um, many, many different techniques out there and many co uh, companies as well. Um, there is one named Illumina. I work with Illumina sample. Um, well, well, I work in the dry lab, so I'm only computational, but um, I work with raw data uh, that comes from Illumina sequencers. Um, I don't work with any other ones, but Illumina is one, uh, one of the many sequencers out there. And I did link here a YouTube video so that we, you could watch what DNA sequencing actually looks like. And now just to, now that I'm done with um, defining some of those biological terms, I will be talking, talking about the subfields. So you have genomics, which is ultimately, it's the study of the genome. So it's uh, looking at the structure, the function, the mapping and the evolution of genomes. Then you have the transcriptome, where you're concerned with understanding the changes and um, caused by conditions and treatments in the transcriptome. So, so as I mentioned, you have a control, which is a, a healthy sample, and then you have your um, your treated sample or or sample that's diseased, and you try to understand how those the 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 mRNA transcripts differ between the two. Then you have proteomics, which is the study of the proteome. So you're you want to study how the proteins function, interact with each other. Um, metagenomics involves sampling an environmental um, sample. So you, you go into a remote field or um, somewhere like that, and you just take a scoop of soil or you take 
um, some water and you try to find what genomes are in that sample. Ultimately, you're trying to find what the microorganisms are present in, that in, the, in the sample. Then you have genetics, which is the study of heterogeneity and the variation of inherited characteristics. Phylogenetics is studying uh, evolutionary relationships and how evolution um, progressed. <laughs> then you have metabolomics, which is um, studying metabolites and uh, the biochemistry of metabolism. You have structural analysis, which is um, analyzing, predicting um, the 3D structures of your uh, nucleic acids, so RNA and DNA, and also importantly, proteins, because proteins have very different um, tertiary and quaternary uh, structures. And then you have molecular modeling, so you're trying to model, again, proteins, um, these molecular structures uh, via computational chemistry, and then you have your systems biology, which is um, performing computational modeling and analysis of complex biological systems. So the summary of this section is just to um, basically that bioinformatics combines many different um, fields in science with the purpose of creating and developing tools to, to collect, store, and analyze biological data. And by studying this data, you would the goal is to make scientific discoveries, find something new about um, a specific sample or tissue. And there are many subfields in um, bioinformatics that relate to different biological fields. So having uh, a good background in biology will help you a lot as a bioinformatician. And now just to talk about uh, the data types. So the first one would be a FOSTA file. This is one of the uh, simplest ones and the first ones that I actually learned in my undergrad. So a FOSTA file is a text format file um, that stores sequence data. Very, very simple where uh, you have the structure uh, beginning with a header, which is a very, it's, it's a descriptive line or a descriptive sentence uh, for the sequence. And you would know it's a header because it starts with a greater sign, um, a greater than symbol. And then the following lines are just your sequence. So depending if it's uh, DNA, you would have uh, the G, A, T, and C characters. If it's RNA, you would have G, A, C and U for uracil. Um, and the, the lines have to be between 60 bases, um, but sometimes I've seen 80. So when I was in undergrad, they were up to 60 lines. So I think they've changed recently. Um, and some use cases for these types of files, they are used for um, some software tools actually do use FOSTA files, so such as BioStrings and tree to fosta but these, FOSTA files are also used for uh, local alignments. So if you know the software database or uh, this tool, it's called BLAST and um, it's by NCBI. So if I, I link to it over there. Essentially what this tool does is when you give it a string of DNA or RNA, depending on the program you want and your, your data, uh, it would search through its database for any organisms or species that would have that sequence. And it uses statistics to give you the best um, or the highest hit. Um, so it's, it's the, the best scoring uh, organism. Then the next um, file is called a BCL file. So this stands for binary base call format. So this type of file, it is the raw sequencing data that is outputted by the sequencers. So for example, from Illumina. These are not human readable. I can't open a BCL file in like a Word document or something like that. It just, it won't work. You won't be able to open it. Uh, you need a specific tool or a software tool to read this file. So I did just, I sh I'm, I'm showing you what a, a binary file would look like with a series of numbers, digits. But essentially a BCL file, as I said, it comes from the sequencers as raw data. So the only usage, um, that I know of is that BCL files are converted to become human readable. Uh, so the human readable version is the FASTQ file. And that's the next thing I'll be talking about. So FASTQ file is a text file that stores information on the sequence data. So the structure is very simple for each single read 
um, the sequence that was actually um, a, a, a read is a sequence that was um, actually, how do I describe this? Uh, <laughs> it is the, the piece of DNA that was read by the sequencer. And so you could see it in the second line. So the length of it depends on the the tool that you're using, the, the sequencer, and the way that you chopped up the DNA. So for Illumina, it depends. Sometimes it's 100 lines um, long. Uh, sometimes it could be 150. But uh, in general, it starts off with a header, again, to be as descriptive as possible. And it starts off with uh, the at symbol. The second line is the read, which is the sequence that was uh, read by the sequencer. And the fourth line, I skipped the third line. The fourth line is um, for each single nucleotide base that was sequenced, you have a, a quality score, quality information, which is in um, a scoring system called FRED. And so the, the purpose of using these FASTQ files, um, you could access and assess their a quality um, for each individual read by loading it into a software tool called FastQC. Uh, I'll talk to I'll talk about that in a second. And then you also prepare these FastQ files for downstream analysis. So when you load this um, or multiple sets of these FastQ files for each sample, uh, you would put into FastQC, which provides to you a report, and it basically tells you which nucleotides are high quality, which ones are really good, which ones are really bad, and you have to remove them by trimming. So that's the next part is where you would have to sometimes trim these sequences using um, trimmers such as Cut Adapt or Trimomatic is another software tool. And these essentially you choose whether you have to remove them from the beginning, from the end of the, of the read, and ultimately it depends on FastQC. So you would have to look at the results uh, from FastQC to determine where you would have to remove bases. And um, then you would perform alignment. Uh, so alignment refers to um, mapping or taking multiple sequences and putting them all together so that way they could you could find where they align. So you're you're searching for similarities between the sequences. So once there's alignment uh, from FastQ files, you generate SAM files. So SAM files stand for Sequence Alignment Map File Format. So these files contain necessary information on your alignment. Um, usually, an alignment is performed using a reference genome. So this means uh, a genome that was uh, put together from start to finish for, um, for specific species. So for example, there's one for mouse, there's one for human. Um, it just depends on what your experiment is about and what your data is. Uh, so these files, uh, again, they begin with headers, and uh, they start with the at symbol. Then you have your alignment uh, section. So uh, after the header, you would have information on each of your, your uh, reads, the alignment scores, and alignment details. So there's 11 different columns um, that SAM files have on your, um, on your, your reads. I did provide here the, the manual for a SAM file. It's, I use it a lot. I do read it a lot. You don't have to memorize this information. It's already on the internet and it's widely available, very accessible. So when you forget what the format is, access the manual and it's right there. It's really, really helpful and very detailed. Um, and so some use cases for SAM files, um, you could look at alignment statistics using a program called SAM tools. And then you could also um, compress these SAM files because they're enormous. They're very big. Uh, so to make it easier on the computer to open them up to access them, they are compressed into BAM files. So you have a BAM file, which, is, which stands for binary alignment map file format. So it's very similar to a SAM file, but it's just compressed and uh, it is sorted. So now all of the alignments are sorted and um, they contain overlapping specific locations. So that way it's, it's uh, the leftmost contains the beginning of the sequence all the way to the end. Um, typically with BAM files, you could open them up in um, 
this one tool called Integrative Genomics Viewer. Uh, it's very simple, very, very great. I've used it a few times um, where you could actually view the alignments um, for a sample and you could see um, a lot of information based on the genetic information. So you could see um, where there was mutation, if there's any, um, where the, the mutations are, you could search the location. So on chromosome one, you could go to a specific position, for instance, and just um, look at that. It's mostly used for exploratory analysis and trying to understand the data, um, stuff like that. It's, it's a great tool. Um, then you could also create count matrix files for downstream analysis, depending on the data type. And then you could also view statistics of the alignments as well with um, some software tools that could open it up. Um, next is a VCF file. So these stand for variant call format files. They essentially con uh, contain information on genetic variants. Gen genetic variants refer to um, essentially mutations that are found uh, in the genome. So some of the common ones that would be found in a BCF file are single nucleotide polymorphisms known as SNPs. You have indels and rearrangements. So SNPs are basically when, uh, if you don't know, it's the single nucleotide that was changed. So if you have a thymine, it could be changed to an adenine, or if you have a thymine, it could change to a cytosine. Um, indel mutations are when you have um, either one single nu uh, nucleotide or multiple that are removed from the, the genome or they're inserted, or sometimes it's both. And then you have rearrangements of the DNA. Um, so the, the typical format of the file, you have your header portion starting with double ha um, pound symbols, and usually they, they describe the columns of um, the VCF file. Then you have um, the, I guess, the top of the VCF where the information begins. You have the pound symbol followed by chrome. So this is for the chromosome. And these are just the fields or the column names. And then you would have the information on the variants. So each line would be a variant and it's a specific information. And I did provide to you again the manual for a VCF file. So that way you could access and read um, what that information would look like. Uh, so some case of VCF files, um, I have used some VCF files for my recent projects where you would pull information for a specific variant and then consolidate that information into a report to upload to um, a public database. So it's just um, a way to access data and um, just pulling information. You could identify variants based on their position. So you could find on chromosome 20 on this position, what is the variant? Um, stuff like that. It's just for exploratory analysis, essentially. And then the final data type that I'll be talking about is GTF files and, or GFF3 files. These are, these are similar. Um, they're human readable. And ultimately, these contain annotation data. So they have information on features, genes, transcripts, uh, stuff like that. A GFF file stands for general feature format, and a GTF file stands for general transfer format. And uh, again, similarly to other data types, they have a header section, and then you have your um, the your your annotation for a specific feature or or um, gene transcript stuff like that for each line. And I did provide from Ensemble um, this database is really good Ensemble.org um, with their their manual. And so the summary of section two is that there are many data types. Uh, that bioinformaticians should be familiar with, um, some of which are human readable, some are not, and you just have to know which tools you need to use to access those, um, those data types. So um, specifically with data types, you, you should know how the data were generated, uh, which software tools could be used, and also um, what information your data contain and how they can be used. Um, and I would highly recommend that you access manuals uh, if you're uncertain with a specific data type, if you don't know how to use it or access it, there are many um, resources out there. It's really great. And then the final um, topic that I'll be discussing is DNA analysis basics. So what is data analysis? Because as a bioinformatician, uh, you would be conducting a lot of data analysis um, depending on where you would get 
uh, a position. So for instance, if you work um, at a hospital, if you would work at in a government setting, or if you would work at, at a university or college. Um, so data analysis refers to the process of reading, manipulating, and studying data, where the goal of, of data analysis is to make scientific discoveries um, and to find something meaningful or novel to report on. So us as bioinformaticians, we have to act as professionals and experts in the field, depending on the subfield in bioinformatics um, that you're working in, and provide your expertise um, to customers uh, how to analyze their data. So when you're talking to a customer, you should be asking questions of what is the goal of the experiment? You know, what do the researchers want to accomplish and answer with their, their um, with the data? Because they need to prove or disprove a hypothesis for their, for their experiment. And they may even give you um, some suggestions on some software tools that you should be using. Another thing is importantly, asking about the samples and their data types. Sometimes they could give you raw data. Sometimes they could give you account matrix and you would have to figure out how to use that data to get to the, the um, position you need to be in to begin the analysis and, and really delving into um, those results. And then what are some genes that you would be looking for? So sometimes uh, the researcher may know exactly which genes to give you. Um, sometimes they don't. But it's it's great to ask as many questions as possible early on or even during that data analysis. Um, that way you have as much information as possible. And then I, I highly recommend to always do research. Reading scientific articles is the number one thing that a bioinformatician does. Um, reading about common um, common software tools that are being used, current software tools that are being used, some of them may, may not be uh, relevant anymore. Um, and especially on the topic, so you want to know more on the sample types. So um, for instance, in transcriptomics analysis, uh, if you have, um, you're trying to look at some blood samples and, um, you're trying to understand how to um, remove certain so certain cells based on the blood. You have to do some research because sometimes the researcher may not give you that information. Um, you could ask, it's always encouraged, but sometimes additional research is very, very helpful. Now, just to analyze data, um, this is what I didn't really learn uh, until I was really working in research projects. So the number one thing you cannot forget about is the research goal. What are you trying to answer using your data? And then what are the data types? I know I mentioned this several times, but it's very, very crucial to know what data you're handling and how to use it. Um, and the software tools available to you. There's so many out there and sometimes it gets very overwhelming. Um, and so the number one way to learn a software tool is to access uh, tutorials, also known as vignettes. Um, as developers, they, they create the tool, but then they also provide to you a, a way to uh, learn their tool with some sample data. And so uh, you would try to understand their tool, how to use it. You would be reading manuals, trying to um, understand the algorithm, um, and also reading the published scientific articles. So for instance, uh, if you have a specific software tool you want to learn, you would find a scientific article trying to learn how it was used um, and what the, the authors did. Knowing the algorithm is very important because when you're trying to, this is in the next slide, I will be talk, um, just briefly discussing writing a, re a report, but you would have to explain or even just summarize how the software tool, what its algorithm is, um, because it's, it's now, Writing reports is very important, uh, and you do learn that skill throughout your uh, academic career, whether you're going um, to college or university, um, wherever you would be, but writing reports is the number one thing. It's just the way to communicate information. And so knowing how to do, uh, knowing the background of the algorithm of the software tool is very important. Uh, so that way you could communicate that to um, the, the customer. 
and then conducting exploratory analysis. So this it's basically to explore the data and working through the software tools so that you could understand the researcher's data, but also being comfortable with the software tool. Um, so the number one way to get comfortable is just working through the vignettes and creating a lot of visualizations. Um, it's just a, an excellent way to communicate results. So um, I, I would read a bunch of software um, literature on, on software tools and just to see which, which visualizations could be created and which ones are used in literature. How can you present the data um, as, as clearly as possible um, to show the results. Uh, and then the number one thing <laughs> is performing quality control. Having high quality data is so important and you have to start, you have to do this at every single step um, throughout the data analysis. So starting from the beginning, even uh, up to the end, you have to make sure that um, your results are, are good. Sometimes they're not, even though you did a good job following the, the, the tutorial and um, and just working through everything, but sometimes um, sometimes the sample the the data sucks. <laughs> but uh, working through um, each step, trying to figure out and understanding if you did every step correctly, and making sure that the data are high quality is very important. Um, that means removing samples that are that are giving you results that they could be outliers. For instance, they may have data that is not of high quality, so it's okay to remove those. Um, or even in spatial transcriptomics, for instance, when you're or um, in single cell RNA uh, transcriptomics, um, it's okay to remove cells uh, that have really poor results. Um, it's just you just have to go through and keep keep working on the data analysis and just get more comfortable with your data. And then the last thing that I wanted to say was selecting uh, the most relevant information and writing a report. Um, because when you're presenting data to researchers, they are, it, it's also very important to know that some of these researchers may not have any bioinformatics uh, background at all. And so that's one of the reasons why you would want to know what the algorithm is to then uh, explain to them what the program is doing. And then writing the report with the, only the most relevant results. You don't want to put, um, a bunch of visualizations and plots there that they, they don't necessarily need to be there. But you learn that as uh, you work through projects and you get um, advice from teachers and professors. So you learn this over time. I don't want to overwhelm anybody. <laughs> it's just uh, the field is very, um, it's very big and it's growing and it's very fun to be a bioinformatician. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to present to you with, um, some, I guess, some resources if you'd want to uh, play around with. So first of all is databases. These are publicly available databases to you. I use NCBI all the time. Uh, they contain bioinformatics tools. They contain databases. Um, it's, it's a very, very well uh, created site. Um, then you have GenBake, UniGene, and SwissPro. I did use them in university. Um, I don't use them as much now, but I do use Ensemble a lot um, for annotation. So I highly recommend you to check these out. And there's even more. There's so many out there that you could access and play around with. Now, as just in terms of the um, languages and software tools. So for the languages, when you're first getting into programming or even just in your bioinformatics um, career, I highly recommend you learn Python and R. I started off learning Python. Um, it's a it's a great language, uh, and R I learned in my master's uh, in my graduate program, and I use it all the time. These two languages are mostly used, and then uh, there's also shell scripting and using the command line with Bash. When I refer to scripting or creating scripts, that means uh, you're writing a set of instructions that the computer can understand. Uh, to run your programs. So it's very important to know how to write these sets of instructions. Um, and uh, I would say, start with the tutorials. Um, and there's many online resources out there um, where you could learn how to program. 
Uh, and then there's the commonly used software tools um, used in bioinformatics. And this is just uh, one table that I created, but there's so many tools out there um, that you could find software tool, um, or you could even browse, the, um, I believe I saw on Wikipedia, they had a whole list of bioinformatics tools. Um, I highly recommend reading literature though, um, where they, they actually would outline more tools. But just the basics you have for your quality control with raw data using the FASTQ uh, files, using FASTQC and MultiQC. Uh, then you have with alignments, it depends again on your, your genetic information. So whether it's DNA or RNA, you would use a specific aligner uh, for that. But here I just listed a, a few for you to check out. Then it's viewing uh, alignment and variant call uh, statistics using SAM tools and VCF tools. Then there's trimming. So when you have to trim from the reads after the sequencer um, gives you the sequence or the read, there's cut adapt, trimomatic, there's also flex bar, and then data analysis tools. So it depends on um, whether it's an, an R package or it could be a Python package, but it's just different ways that you could perform data analysis. And so as just for the summary of this, um, this section, the ultimate goal of data analysis is to be able to handle large data and make discoveries because biological data is huge. Sometimes it could go uh, hundreds of gigabytes, very, very large. And so um, you need to remember the research goal of the hypothesis or the, sorry, of the, um, of the experiment that the researchers are um, trying to work with or try to answer and also looking for software tools that could help you. And then conducting research and uh, learning new methods and algorithms and tools uh, is so important. You, as a bioinformatician, you never stop learning. And that is always great because you're working your brain all the time. <laughs> but um, you, yeah, it's it's a lot of reading um, and being on the computer. And that was just a very quick quiz. Uh, three questions, very simple. <laughs> And so what is the central dogma of molecular biology? So is it A, DNA to RNA to protein? Is it RNA to DNA to protein? Or is it protein DNA to RNA or none of the above? And I think that you could answer in the chat for that, if you'd like. <laughs> I guess I'll wait maybe a few seconds. But yeah, everybody got it. It's A. Oh, there we go. A. <laughs> Unless I clicked it. I didn't see. All right, good job. Then what is a FOSTA file? Is it a binary file that contains a header and a sequence information? Is it a human readable file that contains a header starting with the greater than symbol and sequence information? Does it only contain sequence information? Or does the header contain the at symbol? <laughs> I'll wait a little bit more. You got it, it's B. <laughs> it's a human readable file that contains sequence information with the greater than symbol. And lastly, what is the purpose of data analysis? Is it to A, read, study, and manipulate data? Is it to make discoveries? Is it all of the above or is it D, none of the above? Yeah, everybody got it, let's see. <laughs> All right, thank you for attending. That's the end of the seminar. Um, and I have here the cita citations for you. Um, I do plan on editing these slides just to add more resources if you guys want, and then I could send them out. Or uh, I guess Jenny would do that. But uh, do you have any questions? I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Um, oh, Emma, go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. I really like how you took us through, you know, the basics of bioinformatics. Um, I guess there's like a lot of information. I'm just wondering, like, um, how did you learn it? Like, did you take classes like in your undergrad or did you kind of get up along the way? Right. So it was mainly um, being in school because uh, it's a 
I guess it's a combination of both because in my undergrad, I, mo I mainly focused on biology um, and my field was just uh, genetics and um, genomics and also immunology. I only took maybe two courses in programming, um, specifically in Python. Uh, and so after um, my undergrad, I finished, I started to attend these seminars on bioinformatics um, and just doing a lot because I took a year off between uh, my undergrad finished and my master's. Uh, and so in that time, I did a lot of exploring um, the field of bioinformatics. So I, I found some videos online trying to expand my skills. Um, because when you just complete your undergrad in biology, you don't really learn how to analyze data. You learn how to read papers, you learn how to write, um, but actually analyzing data is something that you have to practice on. And uh, during that time of the, the space in, while I, before my under, uh, before my master's, I did, um, I tried to practice some programming uh, questions that I would find online. There's a really nice website called Rosalind that has um, bioinformatics questions that you could, or like pro problems that you could work through for programming. Some, some of them were easy, very relatively easy. Some of them were really hard. I didn't practice through all of them, um, but then uh, I had some grasp on the field at that point. And then I went into my master's where I did learn a lot of, um, a lot of broader skills. It wasn't like now I, I could consider myself as a bioinformatician because I know how to analyze data, but I learned these skills in, in my work. In school, I necessarily, uh, I did projects and I was really testing the waters. Um, like I, I highly recommend if you guys um, would pursue bioinformatics to take a graduate course because you do learn so many skills and you actually learn how bioinformatics is applied in the real world. It's it's really, really fun. Um, but then you would have to do experience. You you need experience to practice those skills because then you forget. So uh, I applied to research positions. Um, I had a research position in my master's project. Uh, well, the master's project was different, but in my, re in, my um, in my master's, my graduate degree, I worked uh, as a research assistant for one of my professors. And that's where I learned how to analyze transcriptomics data. And uh, that's where I really, um, I knew I wanted to stay in the field of genomics, trans transcriptomics. Um, and I, I just worked with that. And then um, after my, my uh, assistantship ran out and I finished my, my degree, uh, then I started to learn other skills as well on my own time. It's a really, you have to continue those uh, skills on your own and learning constantly, um, which is, I don't want to pressure you or scare you or anything, but it's, um, you, you have to do this for every other field, even for, um, if you're a computer scientist or um, I know that they also have to create projects on their own. It's just how it is. Um, expanding your skills is very important. So um, yeah, so just it's a combination of both <laughs> in summary and <in> short. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. I know that was a whole ramble. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for talking about your experience. Yeah, no problem. Uh, there were also some more questions from the chat. Mm -hmm. So the first one was, um, what high school courses did you take in grade 12 before your undergrad? Um, so I took biology chemistry, um, mathematics. I didn't take physics uh, because I already took physics in grade 11. Then what else did I take? Uh, I can't remember the other ones. It's been, it's been a while, but um, I would say that if you take academic, I think it's academic uh, high, school, high, high school courses, I took those ones. I didn't take any AP courses. Um, and yeah, because in first year university, you would learn, technically you would go through the concepts that you learn in grade 12 again, but then added more information. So that's why I didn't take uh, the second physics um, because I, I, would, I, I learned that new, um, like all, all over again in my university. Yeah, in uh, first year. 
Yeah, it makes sense. And do you need to already know how to program in order to be a bioinformatician? Um, I would say you would need some skills, yes. Uh, you could learn it on the job or like as your research assistant, you could probably learn it. Um, I would say you would need the basic skills to know how to program, especially knowing how to use a command line um, because you just have to know how to access data. Um, there's different ways that data is accessed. So for instance, somebody could transfer you the data, um, you could download it, but the majority of it in professional settings, you would access data through, um, how do I describe it? The data stored on clusters, uh, high, high performance computing clusters uh, in a server room. Um, there are a bunch of computers in there and then you would have to know how to connect from your computer to those computers. And so you would access them through the terminal and then um, transferring data back and forth. You would know how you would have to know how to access the files and see them and open them properly. Um, so you would have to know the basic skills of programming. Um, but it's overall, um, it's not too bad, um, not too stressful, not too hard. Uh, I don't have to be a computer scientist to know all of those uh, big terms that are used in computer science. Um, I know how to program, how to use um, loops and conditionals. I know variables. I know how to make classes and uh, stuff like that. It's just those common basic skills that you need. And um, as long as you keep practicing those skills, you will get better and better and better as a programmer. And then you can make your programs even better and faster to run. Um, and you learn that again as you complete projects. I hope I answered your question. And did you pursue a master's right after your undergrad? Do you do you recommend that for others planning on earning a bachelor's of science as well? Yeah, so I didn't. So I completed my undergrad, um, and then afterwards I took a year off from school just so that I could work and just to relax because undergrad is hard. <laughs> Not too hard. You get better. Uh, it's just you want to give your mind a break. And then uh, I did my master's um, a year afterwards. So um, what was the second part of the question? Oh, I and yes, I would recommend doing uh, an undergrad because uh, sorry, uh, a graduate course on the field of bioinformatics because um, undergrad. I I know that U of T has uh, University of Toronto has a. I believe it's a course when I when I was there, there was one. So I, I have to check if that's still if the program is still there, but it does teach you both biology and computer science together. Um, so I wanted to pursue that myself, but I found that uh, it was it really was a lot of work. So um, I decided to just take programming on, on my own and complete my my biology degree um, and then uh, doing the the graduate program really helped a lot because it, it really opens your eyes what bioinformatics is capable of, what you can do as a bioinformatician. And uh, you actually do work on some projects, you work with other people, you learn how to present and how to write reports properly. Um, I highly, highly recommend that you do a, a graduate course because when you do it on your own and try to learn it, you realize how much you miss. And so, uh, those skills of knowing how to present your data properly, how to um, talk to customers. I learned this second, uh, firsthand when I was uh, I was first presenting my 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 data. I, it was very um, geared towards the programming side, but then uh, my professor at that time told me next time try to talk more about the biology and explain those results because. You're, you're working with biologists, you're not working with computational um, individuals. So all of these skills that you learn in school are very, very useful. Um, so I highly recommend, even if you take a year off, two years off, it, and you try to learn these things on your own, you try to pursue, pursue a graduate degree um, if you can. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. <laughs> Yeah, that was great um, advice. And what were the, some of the requirements to apply for a research position? So, okay, that's interesting. So for those type of field, um, I would say look at the job description because that's how I used uh, 
I would read the job description, highlight the important, the qualifications, what skills are required, um, what you would be doing with those, uh, or what you would be working with in the research position. So, um, like, what would you be doing? Because those are important. Then you could focus on those skills and try to learn them on your own. So um, you would be then able to apply for a similar position later in the future and just be like, I could do this data analysis because I have this necessary skill. So um, I would say read the job description. If there isn't one, for instance, if you just contact uh, a professor or a teacher and you just want to ask them if they have a position available so for volunteering, that's also very important important you just tell them in a professional way what you're capable of uh, doing as um, as a student and it's okay to say well I can't do this but I'm willing to learn it's very important to always say that you're willing to learn and you actually do try to learn it um, so that that's what I would recommend reading through the job description very carefully and uh, trying to cater your resume to be like the um, to include those terms into the resume and you actually learn those skills, you know them. Yeah. And the last question is, what are some of the degrees a bioinformatician needs to complete and how do degrees work? Right. Um, so when you're, this is kind of hard to explain because there's so many subfields in bioinformatics. So when you're in undergrad, you get to choose a program. So um, what your field is, what you're trying to uh, learn. So for instance, for me, when I went to undergrad, I chose biology um, from a list of other degrees. So the degrees are what would be on your diploma and what you would be focus on, focusing on in your four years at university. So um, in biology, you would take a series of courses in biological terms. So in genomics, in uh, biotechnology, in molecular biology, in microbiology, immunology, anything that's related to biology. And um, ultimately, it doesn't matter uh, as long as you like what you're studying. So for, for instance, you could be a, a biochemist and you could still become a bioinformatician as long as you know um, what you could do with that data. So you could, um, you just be, I, that's what, I'm having a difficult time answering this question because you could even become a bioinformatician if you're a computer scientist. Um, in my graduate degree, there were students who didn't have any idea of biology and they, they were in the, the program because they wanted to apply their skills to develop tools in, bio, in bioinformatics. So, um, so for, for them, they were focusing more on artificial intelligence and how to apply it to bioinformatics. So it's ultimately if, um, I guess if you're focused on one field, so if you like computer science or if you like biology, then you would try to complete your, your degree, your diploma in undergrad for that degree and then you could try to pursue a degree in bioinformatics uh, and then you could learn biological terms and um, different ways that it could be applied uh, and importantly when you go to a graduate uh, program you do practice your skills by completing a, um, a project so whether that's a research project I only did my graduate degree in one year it was um a University of Guelph, it was just a master of bioinformatics one year program, and uh, I completed my research project in eight months. So you develop, you, you decide what your pr project is about, and then um, you work towards it. For some master's or graduate degrees, you would do it over a series of maybe two years, three years, or a PhD is four years. So um, ultimately, it just, I don't think that there's, you have to do multiple uh, degrees unless you're trying to become like a PhD candidate um, or really getting into research in the field. You could really do your undergrad in any scientific field and still become a bioinformatician. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I see any more questions, so I guess we'll wrap up our workshop now. Uh, thank you so much to Teodora for um, answering all of our audience's questions and also uh, pretty much running our workshop and also thank you to everyone else for attending yeah thank you everybody I hope you had a I hope you learned something and um I good you know good luck
bioinformatics is really fun and as long as you're willing to learn and um yeah continue learning it's it's great you you get to really um be part of scientific discoveries if you really want to think of it that way so it's it's very fun yeah so thank you and uh have a great weekend bye everyone <laughs>